My name is Peter Milne. I'm the Director of Application Engineering at Aerospike. And I'm going to talk today about principles of high load. So I'm going to talk about writing software to handle high load. I'm going to tell you how Aerospike does it. And I can tell you about what you should do and not do to be successful. You can contact me at this address or you can find me on Twitter. You can actually find me on GitHub with the same HeliPilot50 um, signature. For those of you who are interested, um, one of my vices is I fly helicopters for a hobby. Um, it's a vice because it costs a lot of money and it's very selfish. In fact, if I think if I had a crack habit, I would have saved more money. Let's start with a bit of philosophy. This guy, you know who this guy is. Insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result. Okay. You might not know this guy. He doesn't come out too well on the slide here. But he says, everything that can be invented has been invented. This was a Charles Duell from the US Patent Offices in 1899. So obviously he was right. Okay. The reason I put these up is that if we're going to do something new, like tackle the responsibility of high load processing, we might have to do things differently. And the second thing is, um, you've got to think outside the box. You can't be contained by the knowledge you currently have. You have to think further than that. Now, I'm going to show you a little video here. I want you to watch it. It's only 10 seconds long. OK, it's a 10 second video that I took in December last year at Shinagawa Railway Station in Tokyo. How many people did you see? How many people did you think you see, saw? Any, any guesses? Pretty close. I, I, counted, I tried to count about 250 in there. So there's a lot of people moving in a very ordered fashion. They all use these. You're familiar with the, these in London? The, uh, the equivalent of the, um, the uh, what do you call them here? Oysters. Oysters. Some places they're octopuses and some places they're opals. Well, this is a Suica card and you tap it on the gate to enter and to exit. Every, when you do that touch, a calculation is made to see if you've got currency in the card, whether you can continue the journey that you've made, a whole bunch of things occur. These events occur thousands of times, millions of times a second in Tokyo during peak hour. Anybody here work for cubic transport systems here in, in Red Hill? So your, um, your Oyster card and the Australian uh, Opal card are all produced by cubic transport systems here. And they deal with all of these kind of events. This is an example of high load. Now, it's only high load when everybody's going to work or coming home. It would be really high load if it happened all of the time. So high load are real things that happen in the real world. Let me give you some examples. In the advertising technology space, when you want to go to a website, you click on a URL, and the website is sponsored by some advertiser. You click on that URL, your information, maybe your IP address or your device ID, is sent along to an ad exchange. And the ad exchange says, I have this device ID or this, uh, or this uh, IP address or this uh, cookie. Who wants to bid to show an ad? And so a whole bunch of other suppliers work out that they think, well, I know that IP address and I know that cookie. Therefore, that's a guy who's in his late 50s and he's interested in helicopters and flights to Berlin. So I think I'll give him an advertisement. That was disappointing. Not that disappointing. Buy Max, they last forever. Let's try this again. Okay, so. They determine who you are based on inference because they can't actually tell that it's you. They can't keep that information about you. And they work out that you would be interested in this kind of stuff based upon your past history of interaction in the internet. So you get an ad that's relevant to you. It's a bit spooky, but it's relevant to you. Instead of, you know, you're getting an ad for women's shoes, 
which may or may not be the choice that you're making. Um, I'm not saying anything that's wrong with that. But this kind of processing, you get about 3 million a second in North America, and that's at the ad exchange level. For you to do database accesses, you probably do about 10 or 15 to decide. So that's high load. Another example is a travel portal. Everybody knows Kayak, right? Anybody use Hitchhiker here? The CTO of Hitchhiker is a good friend of mine, um, Nick Dingus. Travel portals have a request. You say you want to go to a certain location. You want to buy a flight from Heathrow to Berlin, to Tegel in Berlin, on a certain day. The travel portal goes out to the airline and says, give me a price for that. And they present you a price. But if somebody else, in the next second, also, and they, sorry, and they actually pay the airline for that quote. So in the next second, somebody wants to do the same thing. They don't want to pay a second time, so they cache that information. It's valid for a certain time period, and they keep track of it. So this is a lot of pairs of places and dates associated with that. And these kind of interactions are millions. They're talking about a million transactions per second. Another example is financial services. So um, uh, day trading or trading on stocks and commodities and futures, they have a bunch of rules associated with them. So the, the overnight storage is in a mainframe somewhere, which is your account. But at the start of the day, your position is loaded into a high velocity database. And the transactions you make during the day are stored durably in about a millisecond to match, the, uh, to match the, the buys or the sells that you've done. And then at the end of the day, they're reconciled back into the legacy database. So once again, about a million plus transactions per second for this particular uh, financial institution alone, whose name I can't tell you because they will kill me. They know where I live. So high load is real. All of the stuff we, we have going on in our lives produces an event. It flows into the ether as apparent noise. And in the big data world, we're starting to uh, divine from that noise signal that we can use for business reasons. And that signal is usually high volume and high load. Okay, so I've given you some examples. I'm going to talk about some principles of high load. So if you recall back to probably your second year at university, I'm going to discuss some things that are from there. First up is Little's Law. Little's Law is essentially the length of the queue you're going to have to wait is the average wait time in the system or the average latency of the system multiplied by the arrival rate. Pretty obvious, pretty simple. Go to the bank, go to the post office, particularly the post office, um, stand in any kind of queue, and Little's Law is the fundamental chunk of that. You expand Little's Law by doing queuing theory, where you study the kinds of work that can be done at the system, the arrival rate of jobs, whether it's an open system uh, work or if it's a closed system work, whether it's a batch work. And you can forecast, based upon the arrival rates, the type of work, and the latencies, how long something's going to take. For an example, if you're all going to the ATM, the arrival rate of people coming to the ATM is not affected by how fast the ATM gives you money. That's an open system network. But if you're entering things into a web page, you can't enter anything, things into a web page any faster than it's, till it's finished the previous request. That's a closed system workload. Okay, so that's queuing theory. Let's talk about throughput. Throughput is the rate of production. So the amount of things done in the time taken, very similar to the idea of power, work done over time taken. So the throughput of your system is directly proportional to its power, or the power of your system, the value to the business is directly proportional to its throughput. Just a little aside on that. You know that time's money, okay? And knowledge is power, right? 
If you substitute that into the formula and rearrange it, you'll work out that the more knowledge you have, the less money you make. Okay, latency. Everybody mentions the word latency. What does it mean? It's essentially, it's the time it takes to start here and end here, whatever this thing is. So, in a network sense, that might be when you send your TCP IP uh, message on the socket until it's received at the other end. It might be until you start to do an I.O. to some kind of storage until it's finished. That's what latency is. It's a measurement of time. People talk about low latencies. They want a small time. Concurrency. Here's a wonderful term that everybody misunderstands. Here we have an example of a set of things that are happening. These blue people are coming along. They're running concurrently at the same time. At some point, they want to use a shared resource. So the person who arrives first takes a lock on that resource. They use it, whatever, and they release the lock and they carry on. So concurrency is about things happening at the same time, possibly sharing a resource. Parallel processing, let's be specific for computers here, is where we're going to have things that use more than one processor, or in the modern terms, more than one core, at the same time. In these circumstances, whatever those problems are, they're being processed at the same time. They're not using a shared resource. Stick with me. I know this is boring Computer Science 101. We'll get a bit further along. So keep this picture in mind. This explains it all. Concurrency is we have two things running along in time that are running at about the same time, but eventually they interact with each other because they're using a shared resource. Parallelism is where two things happen at the same time and they don't use the shared resource. Uh, in the airport where I take off from the most, which is unfortunately Dallas, Texas, Dallas is a shit of a place. Um, sorry, did I say that out loud? There are four parallel runways so that four aircraft can take off or land at the same time. If there's any more than four aircraft doing that, then they are starting to share the resource and there are concurrent flight operations rather than parallel ones. Okay. Everybody's heard of a bottleneck and everybody knows what it is. I want you to think back to your thermodynamics that you learnt in high school or, or university. This is a throttle, right? A choke. So right here, at this point, there's a lot of pressure and the temperature increases. Everybody gets a bit hot because they're waiting for their term to come through here. When you pop out this other thing, everybody freezes. The temperature drops because of the change in, in, in volume. Bottlenecks are a choke point a throttle where something closes off, where blockages can occur. Bottlenecks are caused by lots of things in computers, some by you. Are we good so far? All right, three things. Let's talk about locks. And a lock is an atomic latch. It's usually implemented as a single processor instruction inside the machine. It usually has a system service in the operating system that allows you to directly obtain a lock. Locks are often named. And you hold on to that lock and you release it at some time in the future and uh, somebody else can't acquire that lock until you've released it. Okay, there's a little joke in here. Some years ago I built a distributed lock manager for a system. It was written in an OA language and I had a Rapunzel method and uh, the Rapunzel method would only be called by system administrator to release all of the locks. And that was the joke, Rapunzel, Rapunzel, let down your locks. But um, it didn't make it into production, by the way. They changed the name of the method. A mutex is kind of built on top of a lock, but it's the combination of a semaphore and a lock. So I acquire the lock, and instead of when I release it, at the same time I wave my hand and say, it's free! and the person next in the queue acquires that lock. So that's what a mutex is, mutual exclusion. And the last one is a critical section or a critical region. This is where you put something that bounds a piece of code. 
and that two threads of execution won't pass through it. It will be single threaded at that point. If you're a Java person, that's your synchronization blocks or your synchronization methods. But critical regions have been around for a long time. All of these things are enablers of concurrency and disablers of concurrency. They all affect how fast things go. Basic computer architecture. There is a CPU. Let's start with just one. There is RAM or main memory. There is some kind of input or output port that goes off to your devices, like your keyboard or your hard disk or your network interface card. There is an address bus that everybody shares. There is a data bus that everybody shares. And there is a control bus that says to these things whether to put your data on the address bus or on your data on your, on your data bus. Okay, that's fundamental kindergarten computer architecture. Nothing in there is parallel. Nothing in there runs concurrently. It all runs serially. That's the architecture of a mid-1980s uh, mini computer or the, the, the uh, arrival of PCs was along those architectures. So we use these kind of words. We use the word multiprocessor, and in the modern world, a multiprocessor is two separate chips, or more than one chip, that shares the same bus structure. And you have something like a bus arbiter that decides whose turn it is to use the bus. So you've moved the processing up a little bit. You've got more um, calculation power, but you still have some potential bottlenecks or contention on the bus. A multi-core is where you have more than one processor inside a chip. So today we routinely have uh, four core processors. Intel are bringing out really soon 64 core processors which are blindingly fast. Each of these have a little bit of local memory associated with it. And then they can access shared memory, so non-uniform memory allocation, allocation, NUMA, not to be confused with um, Clive Custler's books, um, is the way that you can use some local memory and then you connect that to a multi-channel bus. So instead of having just one address bus or just one data bus, you have multiple channels, so parallelism can occur as opposed to concurrency. All right, so I've given you some hardware. Now let me do one more thing. I'm gonna talk about Flash specifically because Flash is something that Aerospike uses to make itself fast. Uh, up until now, we've had spinning rotational disks. I've gotta make sure I don't run out of time. That's your job, Dash. We've had spinning rotational disks that have an elevator algorithm on them and they have been the same since I started in the computer industry when we had Babbage machines and abacuses. They're all the same algorithm. It's not changed, it's just faster and smaller. <coughs> One of the things that is a big game changer is flash storage. You know the memory sticks that you have? They're actually a um, floating gate, metal oxide semiconducting field effect transistor. And they're arranged inside the chips and on the circuit boards in a similar way to RAM. So um, these are all transistors here. And so you've got source lines, bit lines, and word lines. So it's a, a matrix like in a RAM. So Flash doesn't need a spinning disk elevator algorithm to find a particular um, block of storage. Also built into Flash devices are many parallel paths. So they can actually do 16, 20, 400 parallel operations at any one time. Okay? They're not like spinning disks that can only do one I.O. at a time. You get these things as packaged as uh, serial ATA um, devices, which are fast, but the PCIe ones are blindingly fast, so you can get improved speed. I'm talking about things that are going to uh, allow you to do high load. No traditional latencies, no rotational problems. Okay, 
So I've talked about the use case. I've talked about some technology at a computer science level. Let me tell you how Aerospike does it to get our speeds. And this is as close to a sales pitch as I'll get for you. So, give you a big picture of Aerospike. We have a client component, which is like a driver, which sits in your application. And we have a cluster or a federation of servers with locally attached storage. This is the cluster that's high speed as a database. You access it from your client. Let me tell you why we can do it so fast. In the client space, we take a key, the primary key that you give us, and we hash it with the RIPEMD160 hashing algorithm. Randomly, random algorithm produces a 20-byte digest from however big the key is. Always a 20-byte. Very random, so that two keys that are similar end up with very randomly different hashes. There's no reported collisions with RIPEMD160. If you find one, please let me know. I'll write a paper with Dash and we'll get a Nobel Prize for it, okay? So, so we use our digest for a bunch of things. We use it as our primary index entry, but we also steal a few bits of it and we use it as a petition ID for that record. So that record's gonna be chunked up into a data petition based upon the result of its hash. So we end up with a very even distribu distribution of records across a data petition. You go, why is this important? We have 4,096 data petitions and they're evenly distributed across a cluster. This means that when we present a key in the client, there is a single hop from the client to a node in the cluster. It doesn't go to some place to be looked up, then passed on to somewhere else. It's a single hop. It always knows. The client is also aware of any changes in the cluster when a new node's added. This little table that sits in the client is updated. So it's fast because the hashing algorithm we have is random and even, and it's a single hop between client and server. So a little bit about the, cl the server, the cluster itself. I use the word federation here. Federation is a group of things that act together that have the same rules. Um, a federation of states is a group that have a federal government, a federal set of governing rules. So it's a group of local servers. They're networked close to each other. You don't have one in, in Amsterdam and seven in London. You have seven in London and a remote cluster in Amsterdam. They're separate things. We have automatic load balancing built in by virtue of the fact the way we hash the record. We have automatic failover. We do that because we detect a little message in this locally connected cluster. We detect a new node when it's added from the same mechanism. We rebalance at a rate. So if you have a problem where you're gonna get lots of transactions and you want to rebalance them for some reason, do the rebalancing at a lower priority to inbound transactions. You can do it continuously, in fact we do. The idea is that we want to end up with an even distribution but not affect production data. We have the cool things like, um, you know, you can add new nodes under load and we're rack aware. You know, you have that idiot in the organisation who goes into the machine room and just can't resist pressing the red stop button. You know who I'm talking about. Everybody has one. I've got a story about that I'll tell you later. But we use locally attached storage deliberately to get the velocities that we want. You cannot get millisecond response times, millisecond latencies out of a SAN or NAS storage. So we have locally attached storage. I mentioned that we distribute data evenly and that has to do with the hashing algorithm that we use. There's a fixed number of data petitions and the organisation of a cluster evenly distributes data petitions across the nodes in the cluster the records are evenly distributed amongst data petitions by virtue of the hashing algorithm. And we evenly distribute data across flash devices that are stored within a node. So what I've been talking about here is sharding or petitioning an application. We're doing it from a database perspective. So our algorithm to petition the work of the cluster is quite robust and handles all edge cases. 
So when we get a new node in the cluster, we've got a cluster of three nodes and we add a fourth one. We're adding it because we want more storage capacity or more throughput, more I.O. capability. The cluster discovers a new node. They have a little gossip about it and they discover the new node. A Paxos vote occurs in about 50 milliseconds and says, okay, we're going to reorganize the data partitions and then we'll let the nodes reorganize the data. So there's no rebalancing, no manual rebalancing. This in itself takes, about, um, takes away much of the hard work in running a distributed system. So let me tell you about the storage layer. One thing that makes Aerospike fast is that we have our primary, or all of our indexes sit in RAM, always in RAM. They're a, a, a red-black tree, you know, classic binary tree structure based upon the, the hash table. We can store data in RAM, which is everybody does. It's not so interesting. One of the cool things we do is we store, we can store the data optionally in the flash device. Rather than storing it on a spinning disk in a file system, we read and write blocks directly because we know what we're going to read and write. We have a continuous background defragmentation, so when a block gets empty, we can defrag it. Runs continuously, it's like garbage collection. It runs for a certain number of blocks every certain period of time, and it stops and takes a breath. For those of you who are too young to understand, this is exactly what you used to do in the days before re relational databases. We had index files, and you had index blocks and data blocks, and then you would defragment them every so often. So, I've mentioned it twice already, but I'll say it again. We don't have a file system between Aerospike and the flash device. So we don't have the right amplification of a volume table of contents and uh, file extents. We just read and write blocks. They're our blocks. We put records in them. They're our records. We know what we're writing. So we optimize to use flash very fast. Flash is faster than spinning disks, always. Put a flash device in in place of a spinning disk and it'll be faster. If you can take the file system off it, then it will be many times faster. Many times faster. I can give you reasons later on. There isn't enough time in this presentation to cover it. We also do some cunning things about the way we do a write. And surprisingly, this works with any kind of storage mechanism. When we do a write, so imagine we've done a read, we've read it from the old location and it's gone up to the client, done whatever else it needs to do. When we do a write, we write it to a new block. So we write continuously like a log file, like a circular log file over the device. And the write is faster. It's called copy on write. Some database technologies use it, but we use it extensively. Then we recover the old block. That gives us a very fast access to flash and we evenly wear the flash device. Um, should I talk about that? Yes, just very briefly. Floating gate MOSFETs have this little control gate in them, and uh, eventually the insulation in the control gate breaks down, and so the bit becomes unreliable. And so they talk about the wear on a flash device, and that's a pub discussion as to whether you can do that two million times or five million times, and, it's like deciding which is the best football team, or which is the best religion, or what's, you know, those kind of things. It's, it's a pub discussion. So um, the way to do it is you don't transition certain bits too many times, and you get even worse. So we do that with our flash devices. One of the last little bits inside the Aerospike daemon is probably the most uh, simple but powerful patterns that you need to implement in any kind of server. Traditionally, you've probably had a server where you've listened on a socket, and when you get an inbound request, you start a new thread, and it processes that inbound request and terminates it, or you have a thread pool. Okay? That gives you some usage across the multiple cores and multiple processes in your server. But this pattern is what we use to make sure we use all of them. So we have a bunch of server threads Service threads that listen for inbound requests from the TCP IP stack. If you have a multi-IRQ uh, uh, TCP IP device, like a, a, NIC, a NIC card, then you have multiple threads. These listen for the inbound request 
And once they've got them, they put them back into the, put them into a service queue and then they go back and listen some more because the network's very fast. On the end of the service queues, we have transaction threads, configurable number, that go out and do the, the time-consuming pieces of work to read and write from storage and retransmit the data back to the, to the caller. Because the, the threads are separated by queues, you can adjust these numbers of them to match exactly your workload. So, with this pattern in Aerospike, I can take a standard Aerospike server, play with these numbers without really thinking about it, and get about four times the throughput through the daemon just by changing those numbers. If it was just um, a thread per request, I wouldn't be able to do that because you'd get come some concurrency uh, problems. So this is the last marketing slide, then I'll talk about some, some principles. This is a, a benchmark that Thumbtack did with Aerospike and a few of the other similar databases in our space. You, you can see that as latencies go up, there's a problem. With Aerospike, we end up with this flat latency. We end up with this flat latency because we distribute the workload evenly amongst the servers in the cluster. Evenly amongst the, the data is distributed evenly amongst the devices within a server. And we have multiple threads that run to do specific kinds of workloads so that the CPUs are used completely. None of them are idle. That's why it works. I've just told you all of the secrets in Aerospike, why it runs so fast. You could actually download our source code and build your own. Um, let me talk about things that cause high load failures. The first one is the network messages. So in the modern world, we just use TCP IP. Those of us who are of my ilk knew that there was other kinds of protocols that existed, but they don't exist today. The first problem you have in the, in the network world is you're sending elephants as your messages. You might need to send elephants, but they've got to be squished down. They've got to be serialized or marshaled to fit through the TCP IP socket and then pop out the other end. So that's the first problem. Think about the size of message you need to transmit. I have some wonderful anecdotes that I don't have time to share from real projects by smart people who did stupid things like send elephants down to the server to have the elephant's toenail painted pink and then they pull the elephant back up to the client. Um, the other problem is you might be sending mice, but you might be sending a lot of mice. The mice fit through the network socket really nicely, but you're sending too many across that network segment, across that socket. Things to measure. The next one is network design. You've got yourself this wonderful gigabit network running where all of your uh, server farm is, and you've got this wonderful gigabit network running your, your clustered database, Aerospike in our case. And somewhere between the two, there are two guys sitting with Morse keys, sending Bordeaux to each other at the lightning rate of 75 board or 75 bits per second. You think this is funny, but believe me, somewhere in your network, there is one of these. And it's in an obscure place that doesn't get used very much, but might get used occasionally. And occasionally you have this problem. You have timeouts you can't explain. Get your network engineer to look through this. Anybody in the room a network engineer? OK, I'm about to insult you, so please forgive me. Network engineers are like Scotty on the Enterprise. You know, Captain Kirk says, give me warp factor five. And then Scotty says, she can't take it anymore, Captain. Um, they tend to own the network, and they're pretty good, and they're very embarrassed when they find something like this. You go, oh, we've had a problem with network, and it's not the network, it's not the network, and then all of a sudden it's really good. And you take them out to the pub, and they told you, well, there was these two guys with Morse keys that we put a, we put a router in the middle, and it fixed the problem. So somewhere in your network, you might find one of these, and it'll be so obscure, you actually need a good network engineer to find them. So that's the next problem. The other one is how long do you hold on to a lock? So, you know, begin transaction, do seven million things, end transaction. You're holding on a lot of locks for a long period of time. So big locks increase latency at some level. They decrease 
concurrency because everybody wants to share it and you end up with a bottleneck. Remember on a bottleneck on this side of it, everybody gets hot and bothered and on this side, everybody's relaxed and cool. So you want to avoid big locks. Make your locks as small as possible. Okay. Um, you might not be using your computing power effectively. Everybody's seen this scene. This is the local council workers. One guy's up on the, on the ladder doing the work and everybody else is standing around going, yeah, it's rainy today. What did you think about that movie on telly last night? You know, and they'd have that conversation. So these guys are, are do some function, but are most of the time idle. So look at things like your IRQs that you have in your network particularly and see if you can balance them across the CPUs. Rather than have one CPU do all the work, have all of them do the work. Um, your code doesn't use multiple cores. It's single-threaded because it was written a long time ago by a guy in a garage and he never bothered to think about multiple threads because multiple concurrent processing, you need to think a little bit differently. So look at your code. Um, then look at the cores as they process to see if you can find why one core is doing more than the others. Why you got one guy on the ladder and the other guy's looking at whatever's going past. The last one is a little more subtle. Non-uniform memory allocation is using that local storage or that local cache that's associated with the CPU where you can try and use that. There's some tricks if you're a Java person. There's some tricks in the JVM that you can do to use that. If you're a C person, think about using jmalloc as a, as a tool rather than just your regular malloc and alloc. There's a bunch of little things. Think about it. High load is achieved by winning on very small little places where you squeeze a little more out of the machine. Okay. In the 80s, programmers worried about CPU cycles, memory, and IOs. I wrote a program that was on a system that had 2K memory blocks uh, and 2K page sizes in memory. And my program was 2K in size and 2 bytes. And that meant it would have taken up 2 pages in memory. And I fussed and fumed and found a way to save those 2 bytes. I actually made a message 2 characters shorter so that there wouldn't be a page boundary or a page occur. This is the sort of thing we worried about in the 80s. In the 90s, we worried about our fashion and whether our lipstick was on right, and whether our hair was combed the right way. We worried about whether it was pure OO or that's not the right way or that's not the Java way. We worried about dogma and style and fashion. Dogma is bullshit. Okay? You've heard it. You've been in the room. You said, oh, let's do it like this. And somebody goes, well, that's not very elegant. Or that's not the OO way, or that's not the Java way, or that's not the Node way, or that's not the JavaScript way, that's not the Node way, that's not the PHP way. And you go, excuse me, I want to get the job done. Okay? So what we ended up with is some stupid code. I have a couple of other war stories I'd love to share with you on this one, and it would make your hair curl cool if it's already straight. If it's already curly, it would straighten your hair. But essentially, you end up with stupid code. You get unneeded IOs. You get unneeded object creations and destructions if you're in an OO language. Horrible things. Things like where you, it's like you're going to go to the shop. So you create two new cars, throw, off, throw away the first one, get in the second one, drive it to the shop, drive it back and throw away the car. And so you look in people's code and you have exactly that. So there's a, 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 a memory manager, a garbage collector or something like that going, Oh, shit, I just need these for a few seconds. Oh, they're gone again. Now I've got to clean them up. And it gets overworked. In your code, you can make the garbage collector or the memory manager, your mallox and your freeze, much better by the way you code. This one, loops within loops within loops. I have seen the most ridiculous things where something was calculated. Oh, here's one example. I was consulting at a financial services organization about 10 years ago and they were doing a calculation to produce the number of payments you would need to make and the values of those payments for a 10 year investment, the monthly payments, so 120 calculations. It was a sub-second calculation in Microsoft Excel 
And in the application that was written, it was 45 minutes. Now, um, see this sign here? Does everybody get what it means? Everybody knows what that term is? It's an Australian term. Okay. And unfortunately, one of these people had written that code. And I looked at it and I went, what were you trying to do here? And it was the most ridiculous, it was logical from their perspective, but it was stupid. It had to do with, it had to do with loops within loops and unneeded object creation destruction. It's astonishing. This little one's a bit more subtle. Recursion is a very technically seductive technique to do something very elegantly. But you may be able to achieve the same thing with a simple loop. So the subtle thing about unnecessary recursion is every time you do a recursive call, you uh, create a new subroutine, which means there's going to be a stack frame created and parameters passed. And that costs more than a simple loop iteration. Um, single threaded or single tasks, that's where you do something stupid where you go, oh, I'll just do this all because I can work it all out and it works fine. And you show your boss, see, I've got it running, and they put it into production. And then 15 years later, somebody comes back and goes, what was that code? I know why your batch process takes 36 hours instead of two, because you've done something single-threaded. And the other thing about obtaining big locks, you know, big transaction locks here and big transaction locks there. So stupid code, absolutely stupid code. Okay, let me talk about poor load testing and then I'll talk about my tips for you. You're all from here, so you all remember this. Um, a few years ago, there was a new uh, terminal opened at Heathrow. And it was actually engineered brilliantly and all of the bits of it were engineered brilliantly. But when they opened it, there was a confluence of events that made it a very embarrassing disaster. Particularly, the baggage system failed and 23,000 pieces of baggage did not get delivered. That's a lot, considering what we go through an airport in a day. It's a perfect example of poor load testing. Nobody tested the system at that capacity with that kind of variable sets of data. Now, if you worked on this project, if you worked for it, um, don't be embarrassed because all of the lessons that were produced out of this disaster were then applied to when Terminal 2 was reopened and it was as smooth and as smooth as you can be. So there's no such thing as, um, as a bad experiment. It could always serve as a, um, a bad example. Okay, and you can learn from it. So Uncle Pete's tips in the next five minutes. First thing is make sure your lock size is small. It increases concurrency, reduces latency. That's number one. Parallelism at every step, multiple machines. If you can somehow accurately partition your application to run across multiple machines safely, do so. If you can use multiple cores within a machine, make sure that they are evenly balanced and use them. Multiple threads is a way of using multiple cores or coroutines if you're a Go person, a Go routine, sorry, is a, is a way to use multiple um, cores in a server. Multiple IRQs, particularly in the network space, for $30 you can buy a, an Intel network interface card that has 10 IRQs on it. You stick it in your server, you balance those across the, the, um, the CPUs and you'll get a fourfold throughput through your network, not just 4% better, it'll be four times better. Simple like that. And where you can use a multi-channel bus so that the contention here is not on reading and writing to RAM or, or doing IOs to something. So look for parallelism. You'll never get this, but you might get a good solution of that. Um, when you petition your application up, use a robust, proven petitioning mechanism. If you make one up for yourself, you'll get it about 97% right. And when you go on, when you've got it in production and you go on vacation with your good lady wife or husband or significant other, I don't want to be uh, particularly sexist here, you'll be on the beach and your boss will call and the system's gone down and you have to leave the beach, the vacation, and your significant other looks at you with that look. You know that look. And you arrive back to the office and you go Ch -ch 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 -ch, on two lines of code and the system works again. 
and it was your fault. So, if you're going to petition your application, use a robust proven algorithm. Aerospike based, bases its um, data petitions as the route from the RIPE MD160 algorithm to do that kind of petitioning. And that gives you a way to be comfortable and you can sleep at night. Okay. The latency of your application will be the sum of two different latencies. It will be the sum of the device, device latency and the sum of your stupidity. Okay? So, if you minimize your stupidity, if you can't read what this says, here's a lady on who wants to be a millionaire. Which of the following is the largest? A peanut, the moon, a kettle, an elephant. And she chose an, an elephant. So don't be stupid. It might seem like a good idea, but get it checked by someone else. So if you can eliminate stupid code, even though it might be elegant and beautiful code, um, uh, you can increase the throughput and reduce the latency in your application. All right, nearly finished. So when you do load testing, simulate the load based upon your best guesses. But the best thing is real data. Nothing beats real data. So record live data, borrow live data. There's lots of free data sets around in the world. And then play it back in testing so that it really happens. So I've got everybody sitting on the, uh, the wings of, a, of an aircraft here. I have a video of them testing the 787 wings. So they take this beautiful composite built airliner into this horrible room and they put this hydraulic ram on it and they bend the wing all the way up till it almost touches the other one coming up the other side. That's real load testing. The engineers guessed that it would be right, but then they stuck it into a machine that did horrible things with it to prove that it was right. Because it would be unfortunate if the wing came off while you were flying. All right, down to the final slide. A well-designed application should do three things. It should deliver the right result. So if your application is to add two numbers together, the answer should actually be the sum of those numbers, not an approximation of the sum of those numbers. Okay? It should perform adequately. And in the world of high load, you need to make it perform as fast as you can. You need to do every trick you can to squeeze a little bit out of it. And then it should be maintainable by the average guy or girl. So elegant, obfuscated code should be avoided because eventually you, great guru, god of everything, will move on to some other project and somebody else has to follow along behind you and maintain your code. Okay, any questions? No questions? Nobody wants to know why it rains when you wash your car? You sure can. You sure can. So do you want a solution like a hybrid software, hardware? Um, I, I didn't want to make this an aerospike pitch, but um, we're a software product that's specifically designed to run on Linux. And when we use flash drives, you can buy any flash drive you like, but we recommend to you the ones that we've tested and certified that have good life, that have good performance over a period of time. We have a lot of white papers. My, my colleague and friend, Young Pak, um, PhD in physics type sort of guy is our um, performance lab guy and he tests flash devices to death. In fact, Intel have him come across the road, across 101 in, in California to their labs to test their new devices because he's uh, torturous and he knows how to produce the good ones. Ah. The file system, subjectively, Peter replied, so subjectively, with all the caveats that go with that, a file system will amplify the latency by about 8 to 12 times. That's just accessing a specific sector on a disk as opposed to a block on a SSD. So um, um, my Mac, for instance, has a solid state, a solid state drive in there. So, uh, MOSFET chips inside there, and it's very fast. But it still has a Linux file system sitting on top of it. So it still has all of the same mechanisms. There is a little parallelism, but not that much. 
because it needs to be a generalized file system. SSDs are faster. Um, if you've got a lot of money um, and no sense, you can buy some very expensive SSDs that are blindingly fast. So why spend a billion dollars on SSDs and slow them down by 12 times? Um, any other questions? Yes. The, uh, the elephant's in the mic. Is yeah. I got what you were saying. I wasn't quite sure of your recommendation. Ah, there, there isn't a simple answer. There isn't a single way to say, okay, just have small ones or, or big ones. Um, I used to say, when I first did distributed computing for my master's degree 20 years ago, um, I used to say a big, one big message was better than many little messages because of the protocol overheads. But I'm not sh quite sure. What you should have is the capacity to handle all of your messages. That's the first thing. So the, the size of the network pipe needs to be able to handle all of the messages. And your messages should be as small as possible, but no smaller. So the solution should be as simple as possible, but no, no simpler. The stupid thing was this one um, insurance company in Australia, they had this object graph in the client, which was an insurance policy. Huge, horrible, ridiculous, stupid, 1,400 objects in the object graph that represented the policy, stupid. They would take that and they'd send that all the way down to the server over here they'd change a value in the policy and save it in the database, then they'd copy the bugger back over. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. And they said, well, we need all that information in the server. And I said, it's already there. It's in the database. Just read it. So don't send the elephant across the wire to have its toenail painted and have it sent back. Just paint the toenail. Send the toenail across the wire and have it painted. Okay, an API, we have a bunch of language bindings that you can use. So um, unless you're, well, pick a language and tell me, I'll tell you if we have it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> have you seen a doctor? Um, <laughs> no, I we do have an Erlang binding for it. So you can use it for that. What's it written in? Your the written, the, it's written in C. It's written in clean, well thought out, cleverly, tuned C down to, Andy walks around the office. When Andy's walking around the office, he's got that blank look on his face, you don't interrupt him, because the balls are in the air. And he goes back down and he, and he changes like two lines and suddenly there's an improvement of 2%. And that's what he does, that's his job. Um, he has a PhD in theoretical physics too, by the way. So what tool do you use for your measurement or things like TCP? Um, TC, when measurement, we have measurement tools built into the database and uh, TCP IP itself, you can use any number of great tools. The big win you get out of TCP IP is balancing the IRQs. I didn't believe it till I did it and I was a club fisted idiot when I did it and I got uh, four times the throughput through it, so. Yes. Yep. Because it's a very kind of focused application with sort of very small things. Do you think it's easier to apply these principles there than, say, a sort of enterprise system where you've got these other concerns? Like, sometimes we have to keep internal because it's, it's easy to understand, and the, the really quick stuff is not as easy to understand. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. So, the answer to what you're saying is yes. In a database, there's like four or five, there's two use cases. You read stuff and you write stuff. And that's it. And so you can, they can be a little more elaborate for that. And we can do some cunning things. The most important thing I showed you was this slide. Um, that, um, this slide. That's a pattern you can apply to anything that listens on a socket and does some work. So this could be HTTP requests coming in here, and this could be something else. That pattern works everywhere. But what you're saying is correct. There is a value in having elegant code that's readable and understandable, and it might run a little slower. And then you might have to have some specialized stuff that's guru. What you want to avoid, though, is fundamentally dumb code. 
D stands for dumb, F stands for fundamentally all <coughs> flaming. One uh, institute that I, one insurance company I was consulting on a few years ago, whenever they did anything, they cloned the object. But they did a deep clone and they cloned these object graphs. And they had a batch process that used to run for 36 hours to do the end of day processing, it was supposed to take two. And it was taking 36 hours. So at the end of the week, it would catch up over the weekend. And we tooled through this framework that was built on a pure OO uh, dogma. And we found that they had this clone method and everything was cloned was a deep clone. So we made a new inheritance hier hierarchy and for this use case snipped and tucked a little bit and the thing ran in two hours. What was happening was for 34 hours the machine was garbage collecting one way or another for a short period of time lots and lots of times. So um, uh, there isn't an easy answer. Sometimes elegant code is good for readability and understandability, but if it doesn't deliver the right result, it's not fast enough, then it's wrong, and that's where you have to fix it. Um, so, you know, we can get into the arguments about what about object to relational map, uh, uh, mapping and all of those kind of things, and when you would use an ORM and when you wouldn't. But it's horses for courses. If you're an architect and it's your um, private parts on the line, that the application runs, then at some point you can say that's elegant, that's wonderful, that's philosophical, but this is where we're going to do it here because it works. So there's no right answer and it is easier for a product like a database, but when you step out, when you get to a 100 use case system or a 250 use case system, maybe 50 of them, you can optimise. <coughs> okay, I'm done. If there's no other questions, thank you very much.